Well, comrades, we are meeting this weekend at a very special moment in history. For us Marxists, the October Revolution of 1917 was the single greatest event in the whole of human history. Why do I say this? It's saying quite a lot, I understand. I said because here for the first time, if we exclude that heroic but tragic and brief episode of the Paris Commune, here for the first time, the masses, and by that I mean the millions of ordinary men and women, working class men and women, not politically educated, not even members of a party, the millions of ordinary men and women overthrew the old monstrous regime of oppression which had existed for hundreds of years and at least began, they began the task, that great historic task which is the source of transformation of society. And nobody can take this away from them. Nobody. No matter what is said, no matter what happens subsequently, no matter all the, the problems and difficulties and even horrors that existed, nobody can take away this colossal achievement of the working people, ordinary working people of Russia as it then was. Now in saying these words, I am conscious of the fact that what I've just said is not fashionable, is it? It's not the thing to say things like that. On the contrary, our enemies, our class enemies are celebrating this event in their own way, from their own class point of view, with an absolute Niagara, a torrent of lies, slanders, and falsification of the most atrocious kind that you can imagine. But of course, that, that should not surprise us, really. You see, for the ruling class... It is never enough to defeat a revolution. That's not enough. No. You must cover the revolution. Cover it entirely the, the, with, with a heap of lies and distortions and filth and slander in order to wipe out the memory of what, what was the revolution. Wipe it out entirely. Such that the new generation, people like yourselves, will be inoculated against any danger of revolutionary ideas. Nothing new in this, by the way. In the 19th century, the Scottish, uh, the great Scottish historian, Thomas Carlyle, one of my favorites since I was at school, actually. Thomas Carlyle was trying to write a work about Oliver Cromwell. I'm talking about the English Revolution. Oh, yes, we had a revolution, you know, believe it or not. A very great revolution about which, unfortunately, not much is known. We'll have to rectify that. I'm working on it. But Thomas Carlyle said the following. He said, before I could put pen to paper, before I could write a single line about the life of Oliver Cromwell, I first of all had to drag his body, his dead body, from under a pile of dead dogs. The slanders and insults directed against, even against the, the revolutionaries of the 17th century. The French Revolution, I, I remember, when it was, the, 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 I think, the 200th anniversary, it would be in 1989, yes, that's right. It, I was astonished to see that in France, the French bourgeoisie, who owe everything to this great revolution, this great work of emancipation, which was the French Revolution, a marvelous revolution, was slandering the memory of Robespierre, of Marat, of Dante, of all the great revolutionaries of, of the past. In other words, the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, has a horror of revolution. They hate and detest and loathe revolution to the marrow of their bones. Yes, and behind this hatred of revolution, you know what lies behind it? Fear. Another emotion. Fear. Yes, because for the bourgeoisie, as for us, it's the same. This is a war. There's two sides of this war. And they have serious strategists. And we are serious strategists of our class. 
You see, they come to the same conclusion. They understand what we understand. That what we're discussing here today is not the events of 100 years ago. Not at all. What they're terrified of, because their system is now in a deep crisis, is the danger of revolution today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And they're terrified, yes, of of us, of you. And therefore, they have this burning need. It's a need, it's a necessity to blacken the name of of Lenin, of Trotsky, of the Bolsheviks, which they do in a very efficient manner by this avalanche of, of literature which is, which is produced. And reading all of this nonsense, this rubbish, it is, it is rubbish, I get more and more tired of the, of the modern uh, so-called intellectuals. In the past, there were one or two decent uh, bourgeois historians, serious historians, like E. H. Carr, who, wrote, uh, who was the editor of the Times, by the way. A bourgeois historian, yes, but at least E.H. Scott tried to, tried to write. He tried to understand what Bolshevism was about. He made a serious effort to explain. I would recommend his book, The Bolshevik Revolution. He doesn't completely understand it, but at least he tried to understand it. Not anymore. That's finished. You know, I had a debate about four years ago with a prominent bourgeois historian, Orlando Figs. How do you pronounce that wretched man's name? I can never. Is it Figs or Figs or Fidges? I couldn't really care less because no matter what is, is written in his birth certificate, he's an idiot anyway. <laughs> but uh, he wrote a very big book about the Russian Revolution. The, the title says it all A People's Tragedy, you see. That's the, the title of the book. That tells you. You don't even have to read the first page. I read all of it for my sins. I had a debate with, with this man. And of course, his line is, a, is, is the, a very common line, which is often repeated now. That the Russian Revolution was not a... Re- the October Revolution was not a revolution at all. No, no, my friends, not a revolution. It was a coup d'etat. A coup in which a tiny... Man, get a load of this. A tiny group of conspirators, of sinister men, led by Lenin and Trotsky... The conspirators took power through a coup. Now, in the course of the debate, I turned to this man, Orlando. I said, Orlando, I said, can I ask you a favor? He said, what was that? I said, well, after this debate is finished, will you please hand me a sheet of paper explaining how this miracle was accomplished? And I will take power in Britain next Monday. <laughs> At nine o'clock in the morning with my tiny group of conspirators. Tell me how it was done. But sad to say, ladies and gentlemen, sad to say, to this very day I've still not received this bit of paper from Orlando Figs. And I'm not holding my breath as to whether I will ever receive it. Of course, it's complete nonsense. It's, it's such arrant nonsense. A child of six would understand that. How on earth can a tiny group of conspirators take power in a massive country of 150 million people? It's just absurd. On the contrary, the truth of the matter is, what they don't want to accept, is the following, that the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was the most democratic, the most popular revolution in history. But one of the best books you can read about this was written by an American, actually, uh, John Reed. You've probably heard of John Reed. He's actually buried in the Kremlin walls, one of two American citizens. Big Bill Hayward also is buried there. He wrote a marvelous book. He was an eyewitness of the revolution called Ten Days That Shook the World. Marvelous book. You read that. Just read that book and you see, not just, you just, you just not only see the events and, 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 and get the facts, you enter into the spirit of it. Because John Reed was a marvelous writer who accurately conveyed truthfully conveyed the real marvelous emancipatory spirit of that revolution. Many years ago when I was young and handsome and slim, (laughs) like you lot, about a million years ago, no, actually it was in 1970, I was studying Russian in, in in the University of Moscow, Moscow State University, and I happened to meet an old Bolshevik, an old lady, She'd been a teacher when she was 20 in the, uh, in the Volga region, I believe. And uh, 
She had spent 14 years in one of Stalin's labor camps, concentration camps. She survived. She didn't want to talk about that. But when I asked her about the revolution, what was the revolution? I will, you know, I will never forget the expression on that woman's face. This was in 1970, in, in the midst of a bureaucrat, terrible bureaucrat, bureaucratic degeneration under Brezhnev. I'll never forget the her face lit up, her eyes lit up. This old woman, and she said, "Well, she said it, you, you can't describe it." She, says, she said, "It's a R Russian word which can't be translated." Kakoi padyom. Any Russian speakers here? I suppose there are. How do you translate padyom? It's a difficult one. A padyom. I would say it's like a spiritual uplift, a spiritual uplift. It's kakoi padyom of a whole people. And then she said, her first change is it not like, quietly she says, not like now, not like today. And you could see that, I could see revolution written on, on, the, on the face of that, of that woman. And like her, there were millions. It's like the French Revolution, you know, the great uh, English poet uh, William Wordsworth. When he was a young man, he was in France during the revolution. And in his great poem, The Prelude, he said the following. Bliss was in, I don't know if you can understand this, all the foreign comments, try anyway. Bliss, bliss is joy, joy, happiness. Bliss was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. William, that's what a revolution is. You know, it's, it's not adequate, it cannot adequately be conveyed in words, but this was an enormous emancipatory act, a great act of, of, of the people themselves who took power through the democratic uh, organs which were the Soviets. By the way, the Soviets, as I said yesterday, and some of you might have been present, was the creation of the working class, these marvelous democratic uh, organs of power. And power was in the hands of the working class. So that's the first thing. It is true that they didn't succeed in, in maintaining that power, Power gradually slipped out of their hands for certain reasons, but it was there, it was there. And as I said in the closing remarks of that uh, documentary, mar marvelous work that Anders uh, did with very little uh, resources, you see, what the rest, what, now of course it's fashionable to say, oh, the Russian Revolution never achieved anything. It was a waste of time. If only Lenin and Trotsky had left the Russian people alone, you'd have had a beautiful democracy and so on. That's a complete nonsense. If the Bolsheviks had not taken power in October 1917, you would not have had a wonderful flourishing of bourgeois democracy in Russia because the conditions for that were absent. What you would have had is a Russian brand of fascism. That's what you'd have had. The, the, the democratic bourgeoisie, the provisional government, had shown itself to be completely... Uh, Bankrupt? Just, th just think of one, one thing. That proves it. Just one thing. What were the slogans of the Bolsheviks in 1917? Peace, bread, and land. Yes? By the way, there's not an atom of socialism in any of those demands. Peace, bread, and land. Theoretically, you could have that under capitalism, can't you? Peace, bread, and land. Peace, bread, and land. And Lenin had it. Yes. And all power to the Soviets. Because the bourgeois provisional government could not give these elementary things. They could not sign a peace because they were tied to the Western Entente, to the imperialists. They could not provide the, the bread. They could not give the land to the peasants who desperately wanted the land. Only workers' power could give these things. Only by taking power could this, be, this program be carried out. Peace, bread, and land, and all power to the, the Soviets. The, the bourgeois the Democrats had the power for nine months and they were not able to solve a single one of the burning problems facing the Russian people. That is why the Bolsheviks took power. And by the way, that's also why the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was a peaceful revolution. That's the other argument, isn't it? Oh, the streets will be running with blood, revolution, buckets of blood, you know... People being shot down left, 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 right, and center. Well, not so. Not so. As a matter of fact, did you see that bit about the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution in the, in the film, the documentary? Yes? Did you like that? Eisenstein. Marvelous film, October. You, 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 
Hands up all those who've seen October. Ah, there are a few cult cultured people in the audience. <laughs> not enough, however. How many have not seen October? Raise your hands. Good heavens above. What do they do with these? <laughs> what do they teach you people? Sergei Eisenstein, in my opinion, is, in my opinion, he's the greatest director of all, film director of all time, certainly. No one would argue that he's one of the great. Uh, and he's a product of the Russian Revolution which is an enormous cultural uh, advance also. But this film of his was done 10 years after the revolution. You saw extracts there. And of course, a cinema, it is marvelous. It's marvelous cinema. And that scene of the, of the, of the storming of the, of the uh, Winter Palace is, is astonishing cinema. It's gripping. Yes. Unfortunately, historically, it uh, doesn't quite stand up to uh, scrutiny. Actually, more people were killed shooting that scene than were killed storming the Winter Palace. You know that. Not surprising with these bombs exploding everywhere. There was an accident, yes, and a couple of actors lost their lives. They were killed in an accident. In the actual storming of the Winter Palace, nobody was killed because they surrendered. There was no fighting. In the film, you can see the, the cruiser Aurora, which is still, you can still see that in, in Petersburg firing uh, bombs against the, the palace and so on, which is true, except that they fired blanks because the Bolsheviks didn't want to damage a cultural monument, you know, a historical building. So no, very few people lost their lives, in, in, in Petrograd at least, in the revolution. And the reason for that is precisely that for nine months, all the basic work of the insurrection had been already accomplished by the Bolshevik party, through, through what? Through, through revolutionary work, through agitation, through propaganda, through explaining the ideas, through passing through the experience also of different, uh, different phases of the revolution. They won the majority. As simple as that, my dear friends and comrades. It is, it is an un, 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 unanswerable uh, fact, an irrefutable fact, that from, from se September to October, there were elections in the Soviets all over Russia in which the Bolshevik party completely swept the board. The Mensheviks and the SRs were, were, were kicked out democratically through votes by the workers, by the peasants and by the soldiers. Such that by, by November the 7th, the Bolshevik party had an, a, a colossal majority, a democratic majority. And therefore, there was no resistance. Even the scoundrel figs or Fijas or whatever his mother might have called him. I call him a few other things, but I, I better not because he resorts very frequently to, uh, to libel cases. <laughs> so I better watch what I say. He's a slippery customer, figs. But as Figs says in his book, he, he says the events of the, of the uh, insurrection were actually more like a police operation. That's all. He actually says that in his book, and yet he's got the effrontery to refer to violence and so on. Of course, this argument in relation to violence has also got a long history. Revolution always means bloodshed, doesn't it? Well, not really, no. It doesn't follow, it depends. That depends on a number of circumstances. You know, a few years ago I was asked to speak. You know the History Channel? Yes? You've heard of the History Channel? Hands up those who've heard of his, uh, who have heard of the History Channel. Ah, the, I thought you were asleep. That's okay. Um, the history, they asked me to speak in a program about the French Revolution. And I was quite surprised at this. And one of them, they rang me up from New York, young chap. And he said, well, before we proceed, Mr. Woods, can I ask you a few questions? I said, yeah, sure. What do you want to know? He said, uh, do you, can you justify the, the, was the French Revolution justified? That's what he asked. I said, well, that's a very strange question. What do you mean? He said, well, you know, the guillotine and the murder and the terror and the cutting people's heads off and so on. I said, well, I said, well, look, you must know the answer to that question better than me. He said, why do you say that? He said, well, you, you're a Yank, aren't you? are an American? I said, yes, yes. And in the 18th century, didn't, didn't you have a revolution, if I remember correctly? He said, yes, we did. And as I recall, you didn't treat the Brits very gently, did you? He said, well, well. I said, and what, what about the second American revolution? He said, what second American revolution? You know, the Civil War, the emancipation of the slaves, Abraham Lincoln. Yes, he said. I said, do you know 
that compared to the size of population, more people were killed in your civil war than were killed in the Russian civil war. Did you know that? He did not. I said, yes, but here's a, here's a strange thing, you know, here's a strange thing. To this very day, nobody's ever asked me whether the American Revolution was justified or whether Abraham Lincoln was justified or the Civil War was justified. Why do you think that is? He didn't have a, a ready answer. They came to London, they filmed me. I spoke for about two hours in the French Revolution. Even the camera crew were fascinated. When it came about, I think I got about two minutes, if that. <laughs> on the, but there we are. It was, it was something. No. Uh, revolution does not necessarily mean uh, bloodshed. It depends. The Bolsheviks' revolution was peaceful because they had an implacable attitude towards the question of power. They convinced and won over the masses, and therefore there was very little bloodshed. Where there was rivers of blood, that's true, as I said in the, in the documentary, where there was an ocean of blood, terrible bloodshed, terrible carnage, was after the revolution in the Civil War when the Soviet Republic was invaded by 21 foreign armies of intervention, including the British, including the British who sent troops to, uh, to uh, Arkhangelsk and Murmansk in the north and so on. 21 armies of foreign interventions and the revolution didn't have an army. It's astonishing. At one stage, the, the territory of the, of, the, of the Soviet Republic was reduced to a tiny area around Moscow and, and Petrograd, which is not much different to, the, to medieval Russia, Muscovy, hundreds of years ago. And nobody was, was given anything for, them, for, for their survival. Trotsky organized the Red Army, which is an astonishing feat from nothing. They showed enormous bravery, the workers and peasants. That shows, by the way, that they were committed. It's not a question of a tiny group of conspirators forcing these people to fight. They fought bravely the workers and the peasants, against the counter-revolution, to save the revolution, of course. Many of them died in the, in the gave their lives in, in the process. But the Red Army didn't just fight with, with guns, as I said in the film. They fought with ideas. They spread propaganda in all the uh, interventionist forces, with the result there was mutinies in every single one of them, including the, the British, who had to be withdrawn. You know, at that time... The Prime Minister of Great Britain was, uh, like myself, a Welshman, Lloyd George. He was a Welshman and therefore very intelligent. <laughs> he was. No, Lenin paid, paid tribute to, to Lloyd George. He, he recommended that the British communists should learn from, study Lloyd George and learn from him. He was quite smart as a bourgeois politician. And in the House of Commons there was uproar when it was announced that they'd withdrawn the troops from Murmansk. There was uproar. And the Conservatives were complaining, why have you withdrawn our troops from Murmansk? And uh, uh, Lloyd George, with his customary aplomb, turned to the uh, House and said, gentlemen, I have, was compelled to withdraw our soldiers from Murmansk because they were infected with Bolshevik influenza. At the time, there was an epidemic of flu, of in, in influenza, flu. In other words, they were, they were, they were uh, mutinous and they were affected by revolutionary ideas. That's how the Bolsheviks succeeded brilliantly in this struggle. And you know why it is that there's this chorus, this hypocritical chorus of horror about the alleged cruelty and bloodshed and sadism of, uh, of Lenin and Trotsky, which is, in, which is without the slightest basis. That's a complete lie. You know, the reason, the reason is this. Throughout the whole of history, 10,000 years of class society, there have been many slave revolts, many slave uprisings. Every single, single one of these was put down with extreme cruelty and bloodshed. I'll take the most famous example of Spartacus, the uprising. Oh, that was a marvelous thing. Just imagine the most powerful empire on earth and a bunch of slaves armed themselves and uh, raised an army and they defeated, they defeated the Roman armies time after time. Eventually, of course, they could not hold on and eventually, eventually they were defeated. But they gave the Romans quite a lot to, to think about, quite a lot of frights. When that slave revolt was defeated, the Romans crucified thousands of slaves all along the Via Appia, all the way to Rome. From the south to Rome, thousands of slaves hanging on crosses. Terrible death to teach the slaves a lesson. 
When the Paris Commune was defeated, 30,000 men, women, and children were slaughtered in cold blood by the Versailles counter-revolution. That's okay. But that's okay. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the, the terrible atrocities allegedly committed by the, the Reds. The reason for this extreme hostility, this hatred of the Reds, of the Bolsheviks, of Lenin, of Trotsky, is this. You have all, all these defeats of slave armies put down in bloodshed. Yes, but on this occasion, for once, the slaves armed themselves, the slaves fought, and the slaves won. That is their crime, nothing else. That's, that's why they can, can never be forgiven, because the slaves, for once, defeated the counter-revolutionaries. And by the way, that saved the world, because the alternative was not, I'm sorry to say this, for Mr. Figgs and others, it wasn't a bourgeois democracy. The alternative would have been uh, General Kornilov, or Krasnov, or any of the other uh, reactionary elements. You know what, Russian fascism... And by the way, Russian fascism would have been a, a terrible animal, a ferocious beast, cruel, sadistic, yes, and aggressive also, would have been wars and so on and so forth. The, the Russian Bolsheviks saved the world from, from, from that and opened up a new prospect. Now, of course, the question arises, why did it not succeed? Well, you see, f from a Marxist point of view, Socialism is not just a good idea. It's not just a good idea which could have existed a hundred years ago, three hundred years ago, a thousand, two thousand years ago. <coughs> How many of you have read the Bible? Put your hands up. How many have read the Bible? You terrible people. <laughs> You'll never get to heaven, you know. <laughs> terrible people. Well, I've read the Bible. I read all of it. It took me about thirty years. I read all of it. And it's a book that's full of uh, wisdom and poetry. and so. I was a bit disappointed by the ending, though, you know. <laughs> that's, that's another matter. But anyway, if you read the Bible, read the Acts of the Apostles. The early Christians were communists. Do you know that? Oh, yes. You join the early Christians. And by the way, that was a religion of slaves. The, the Romans used to say, ah, it's a religion of slaves and women. Women, because women also had no rights. It's a religion of women and slaves. That's what it was. It was a revolutionary movement and it was a communist movement. You join the early Christians, you had to give up all your worldly goods. They didn't accept private property. That's a fact. So why couldn't there have been communism 2,000 years ago? There was no question of communism 2,000 years ago because the material basis was absent. At that time, if there was a, a famine, if the, the crops fell, people died like flies because they had to die. No question. There was no question about it. You just died because there was no food. Nowadays, also, millions of people die of starvation. In the year of our Lord 2017 on the world scale, and I'll tell you something, the difference is this. Nowadays, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why anyone should starve to, 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 to death in the world. No reason at all. I know some of my ecologist friends were a bit confused tell me, oh no, the thing is we, 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 there's too many people and there's not enough food. This is nonsense. The United Nations have published figures to prove that now, not in the future, now at this very minute that I'm talking, there's an, you can, the world can produce enough food to feed one and a half times the present population of the world. If that is not done, it's not because it cannot be done, it's because the system that we live in is a system which subordinates everything to the profits of a tiny handful. One percent, that's all. One percent which have got more wealth than the rest of the humanity put together. And if they cannot produce a, a profit, a sufficient profit from their point of view, then they do not produce. They don't produce. Whether it's steel or shoes or houses or food, it is not produced. Unless it is profitable to that one percent, Okay. But there's no objective reason why anyone should starve. There's plenty of food. There's plenty of means of solving all the problems. Why should people be without houses? You walk around the streets of London. London is an, is, is an expensive city, as you've noticed. It's a wealthy city. It's a very wealthy city. 
Billions and billions and trillions exist. And yet, you walk around this, you'll see this. Plenty of people are sleeping on the, in the streets of London. Plenty of people. Now, at this minute, I'm talking. Is there any objective reason for this? There is no objective reason why this should be the case. Except that the system that we're, we're, we're living under does not allow the productive forces, science, technology, and so on and so forth, or culture and art, if it comes to that, doesn't allow things to develop, doesn't allow people to develop. It cripples society. And therefore, that is what must be broken. And that's what the Bolsheviks started to do. They started to do that. That's their great merit. Now, of course, the argument is, oh, no, they never achieved anything. It was an economic disaster. But better under the private, uh, the, the marvels of the, the, the market economy and so on. Well, not so. I mean, again, you've got to be a fool to accept that argument. A child of six would understand that that is false. Look at the facts. Russia in 1917 was a, a, not just a backward country, it was an extremely backward country. How backward? Can we quantify that statement? Yes, we can. Here's a country of 150 million people. How many industrial workers were there in Russia at that time? I'll answer. 3.5 million, less than 4 million anyway, industrial workers. And even if you ex include the, 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 the widest possible uh, stratum, including miner, mining and transport and so on, it wouldn't be more than 10 million. 10 million workers in a country of 150 million people, peasants, most of whom couldn't write their name, illiterate. That, my friends, that the picture I've just given you, is more backward, considerably more backward than Pakistan today. Okay, And this was an illiterate country. That's an interesting point. It was an illiterate country. And yet, within a very short space of time, a couple of five-year plans, that backward country was, being, was transformed into an industrial power, industrial giant. And by the way, you can see the strength of a, planned of a nationalized planned economy very simply. In the Second World War, and war is a very serious test of the strength of any nation, the Second World War in Europe was really a gigantic struggle between uh, Hitler's Germany with, with all the resources of Europe behind him. Hitler had all the resources of Europe at his disposal when he attacked the Soviet Union in 1940-41. This was, was, was a, a titanic struggle between Hitler's Germany, Germany and the USSR, the Soviet Union. The British and the Americans were mere spectators right up to 1944. I'm very sorry for those of you that like Hollywood films, which, from which we learn that Clint Eastwood and a few others actually won the war single-handed. We know this, but I'm afraid it's not quite true. The truth is that the Americans and British played no role in the, in the war in Europe up until 19, the late 1944 when they very hastily went in because if they hadn't have done that they'd have met the Red Army on the English Channel or in Paris. It was the Soviet Union single-handedly that defeated the armies of Hitler which shows the colossal strength of a planned economy. When Hitler attacked the Soviet Union and by the way his task was made easy by Stalin's horrendous mistakes but that's another matter. The, 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 the Soviet Union was able to dismantle all of the industry which was in the West, involving millions of people, and trans put it on trains and transport it beyond the Euros, where, where the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, couldn't reach it. And within 18 months, the Soviet Union was outproducing Germany in tanks, planes, guns, shells, and so on. And there was the biggest military advance in history. That is a proof of the superiority of a planned economy. Let's remember also that in that war, the Soviet Union lost 27 million dead, half the total of the world. Okay? Yet after the war, without a martial aid, without assistance and so on, they rebuilt, they rebuilt very quickly. They rebuilt very quickly. Let me just give you one index of progress. I said that the, the population, the majority of people in Russia in 1917, were illiterate or semi-literate. But when I was studying in Russia in 1970, the Soviet Union had more scientists 
than Britain, America, Japan, and Germany together. And they were excellent scientists. They were very good scientists. The space program indicates that. Nobody questions the superiority of the Soviet space program. Even the CIA, when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1980s, they admitted that the Soviet space program was 10 years in advance of the American space program. And if you wanted further proof, you just follow the news. Whenever they launch a satellite, the Europeans or the Americans, they launch a satellite, okay, but it's a spa- space station in, in, in orbit, they always use Russian rockets. That's not an accident. So therefore, the argument that a, source, that a planned economy cannot work and does not work is false. It is a lie. What the Soviet Union proved, as I've said in the documentary, I will make no apology for repeating what I said. What the, the Russian Revolution proved, beyond a shadow of a doubt, not in the language of theory, of Marxist theory, but in the concrete language of steel, bricks, space, spaceships and so on and so forth. It proved what? It proved that it is possible to run an economy of a gigantic country, one-sixth of the world's surface, of 150 million people, without private capitalists, without private bankers, and without private landlords, and get excellent results. Because they did get excellent results. Before the war, they had a rate of growth of 20% per annum, which is astonishing. Every year, full employment, unemployment, get a load of this, unemployment in the Soviet Union was illegal. It was a crime. You couldn't be unemployed. Imagine that. It was illegal to be unemployed. I think that was on the study books uh, uh, up until even after the, after the counter-revolution, until about the, the 1990s. And no inflation. You know, it's true that the living standards were not the same as what they were in the West. That, that is true. But nevertheless, for example, rent. The housing was pretty basic. It's also true. But, uh, but people, you could get a flat. I didn't re- remember seeing anyone sleeping on the streets of Moscow when I was there. Or Sofia when I studied in Bulgaria. Okay. And rents. How much do people pay now in rents? I mean, I think in London, you'd, you'd be lucky to get even a, a dog kennel for under about a thousand pounds a month. Or a one, no, I'm serious, one, be, one bedroom flat, a thousand pounds a month. You know, that's one third or half of people's, uh, in, or more, or all of your income would go on, uh, on rent. In the Soviet Union, th- these, these flats were free. The rent was virtually non-existent. They were virtually no rent or, or, or almost no rent. And it included free electricity, free gas, free water, even free telephone calls within the Moscow region. It was all free. That's possible on the basis of a socialist planned economy, even with the, with the terrible distortions of the bureaucracy. That's true. That's the other side of the coin. Because people ask me, well, if it was so great, why did it... Uh, Collapse. That's a good question, which Trotsky answered in advance. In a marvelous book, which all of you should read. And if you have read it, well, you should read it again. It's called The Revolution Betrayed, written in 1936, in which Trotsky predicts with astonishing accuracy exactly what happened in the Soviet Union. You see, once the revolution was isolated... Oh, I, I didn't develop that idea, did I? I said socialism wasn't just a good idea. Socialism needs a material base. It needs a certain level of development of industry, of agriculture, of technology, of science, of culture. And that level should be at least the same level as the most advanced capitalist countries. That was not the case in Russia in 1917. Incidentally, Karl Marx explained this even before the Communist Manifesto in a book called The German Ideology, written, I think, in 1843, wasn't it, Ron? Or 44? 44, yes. The German Ideology, Marx says the following. In any country, in any society, where poverty, where misery is general... All the old crap revives. All the old shit revives. He used that expression in German. 
All the, and what he meant by all the old crap was inequality, bureaucracy, corruption, all the evils of class society will, will re-emerge. It's inevitable on the basis of poverty. You have to have a certain level of living standards before you can proceed to develop a classless society. Now, those conditions were absent in Russia. So why did the Bolsheviks take power? Were they utopians? Hadn't they red marks? They had red marks very thoroughly. They were not utopians at all. You see, the re- why did they take power? Well, for two reasons. First of all, they took power because they could take power. Conditions were there to take power. Secondly, they took power because they had to take power. They had not have taken power, the result would would have been a catastrophe. Would have been the the, the most terrible counter-revolution. Fascism, as I've already stated. Yes, but when they took power, they knew perfectly well they couldn't build socialism in Russia. Nobody thought of that. Nobody even mentioned such such an idea. It was absurd. No, but you see, Lenin and Trotsky, the the whole of the Bolshevik party took power in Russia with the perspective of an international revolution. Not socialism in one country, not a Russian, Russian road to socialism, not, nothing of the sort. They saw the, 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 the Russian revolution as the first stage to an international revolution, particularly in Germany. Lenin actually said on more than one occasion, I will be prepared to sacrifice the Russian revolution for the success of the German revolution. These people were internationalists. Now, you see, that was possible, incidentally. It was possible that there could have been a socialist revolution in Germany. In fact, there was a a revolution in in Germany one year precisely after the Russian Revolution, November 1918. General strike in Germany. The German workers set up uh, councils, Soviets in effect. Uh, The fleet entered Hamburg and Kiel with red flags, the warships flying red flags, without officers. Unfortunately, they had an accident. They fell into the sea. It sometimes happens when you're on ships, you know. (laughs) Officers fell into the sea, unfortunately. Those that could swim, okay. Those that couldn't, too bad. And power was in the hands of the German working class. Incidentally, you know how many people lost their lives in the German Revolution of 1918? Nineteen people. I think more people are killed in, 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 in road accidents in, in Britain on a busy weekend. In London, perhaps. 19 people. And power was in the hands of the German working class. The problem was, and still is, that the leaders of that movement, the German Social Democrats, the reformists, had no wish to take power. They did not believe. They, that's the problem with the reformists even the most left reformists, they do not believe that the workers can, can run society. They don't believe it. They believe that the capitalists and the bankers must rule society because they, they're the natural people to, uh, to do this. And therefore the leaders of the social democracy betrayed the revolution and handed the power back to the German bourgeoisie. The German workers paid a terrible price for that crime in 1933 with the rise of Hitler and the whole world paid an even more terrible crime with the Second World War which is the result of this betrayal. That's the importance of leadership in a revolution. Compare the Russian Revolution to the German Revolution you see positively and negatively. Yes you see but once the the revolution was isolated under conditions of frightful backwardness well one example In one year alone, 1920, six million people starved to death in in Russia. Six million people. There were cases of cannibalism. To talk about building socialism on that kind of basis is absurd. Uh, The population of of Petrograd and Moscow collapsed. If I'm not mistaken, I think I'm right in saying that the population of Petrograd was, at the time of the revolution, two and a half million. And by 1920, it was reduced to half a million. People either dying of starvation or fleeing to the countryside to try and find uh, bread. And therefore, under those conditions is precisely where you get the rise of a bureaucracy. Millions and millions of functionaries and officials who who realize that we, we are important, we are the boys, we have power. Whereas the workers, of course, were demoralized, were tired, were exhausted, hungry, and uh, gradually lost, uh, lost hope, if you like. 
That is the explanation, the objective reasons for the rise of the bureaucracy, which eventually carried through a political counter revolution. Now, what Esteban Volkov said in his brief remarks is very true. The constant lie which is always repeated and repeated and repeated is this. The biggest slander of all is to identify Bolshevism with Stalinism. You heard this argument? Oh, yes, yes. But you see, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ideas of, Le- of Stalinism come straight from Lenin and come from Trotsky. They're the same. That's the argument now. If Trotsky and Lenin would have been in power, it would have been exactly the same as under Stalin. They're the same. Constantly repeated. Bolshevism is an inevitable consequence of, uh, of Stalinism. Really, or the other way around. Stalinism is the consequence of Bolshevism. I beg your pardon. I'm a bit tired. Really? Well, you see, if you maintain that argument, my friend, if you say that, then answer me one question. Answer just one simple question. If Stalin was the, the logical outcome of, uh, of Bolshevism, and Bolshevism and Stalinism is basically identical, why did Stalin, in order to consolidate his bureaucratic dictatorship, why did he have to exterminate all the leaders, all the members of Lenin's party? The entire leadership was wiped out. Stalin killed millions of people, actually. Hundreds of thousands of all, all the leaders of the revolution were killed, ending up, of course, with the assassination of, uh, of Trotsky. No, 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 my friends. Let's, let's get this clear. Let's get this absolutely clear. Stalinism and Bolshevism are not the same. They are diametrically opposed. They are mutually antagonistic and mutually self-contradictory. There's, there's no comparison between Stalinism and Bolshevism. And Trotsky explained the following. He explained it in the, in the, in the Revolution Betrayed. As early as 1930, he said, that, look, this bureaucratic caste, which, by the way, was clogging up all the pores of a nationalized planned economy, Trotsky explained, a nationalized planned economy requires democracy as the human body requires oxygen. Okay? You cannot have a successful socialist planned economy on a bureaucratic basis without democracy, without free speech, without workers' control, without workers' participation. It's impossible. If you do that, then eventually what, what actually happened is that the economy was clogged up and eventually slowed down to the degree that by 1970 the, the rate of growth was zero. In other words, they had all these fabulous resources, scientists and so on, they could not get the same results as the capitalists on, the, on a bureaucratic basis. And of course, uh, I've run out of time now, so I'd better come to the point, which is, which is, which is, which is this, that Trotsky made the point that the bureaucracy would not be satisfied with their privileges. They had enormous privileges, big palaces, dachas, chauffeurs, driven cars, holiday resorts. They, lived like, they really lived like millionaires in the West, that's perfectly true. But Trotsky said, yes, but that's not enough. Because they cannot pass on these privileges to their children, not legally. It's not their property, it's property of the state, despite all the privileges and the corruption and so on property of the state. And therefore Trotsky said that eventually the bureaucracy itself would decide, the bureaucrats would decide to become transformed into capitalists, become the owners of industry. And that's precisely what occurred 25 years ago. The collapse of the Soviet Union was due precisely to the stranglehold of the bureaucracy which was destroying the planned economy from inside and also the conscious urge of the bureaucrats to become capitalists, which, of course, they've done very successfully. Astonishing. The same guys that used to be general secretaries of the party, they used to swear loyalty to the revolution, Lenin, sing the International, all the rest of it, they're now capitalists. Bankers, oligarchs, corrupt gangsters, who've plundered the Russian state, plundered the Russian people, with the most catastrophic results, as Trotsky predicted. I think that I've said sufficient, although I've hardly started, for you to understand the, bas- the basic arguments <coughs> as to why we defend, <coughs> why we must defend the October Revolution, I repeat, 
the greatest single event in human history. And for us, same as for the bourgeois, same as for our enemies, we're not talking about fossils from a museum. We're not talking about the events 100 years ago. We are talking about the situation now. The lessons of the Russian Revolution, the ideas of the Russian Revolution, are the same ideas <coughs> which the IMT bases itself on and, 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 in, and will use to carry through to a successful conclusion <coughs> the greatest task of the emancipation of the working class in Britain, in Europe, and throughout the world.